Hey everybody, welcome to the Rad Dad Podcast Season 2. We've got an extra special guest today, our first female and our first non-dad, but extra special because she is a woman that made me a dad. So uh, welcome Tiffany to the show. Tiffany, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's nice to be the first female. Um, I am Christian's mom, which is my number one most important job. Um, but I'm also a full-time tech nerd, software developer, working nonstop in the aesthetics industry. So very busy mom, very busy employee, but also making it all work as best as I can. And that, that's a great way to put it, uh, making it work the best way you can. And what we're here to talk about today is co-parenting. Uh, we have a unique situation, but it's not that unique anymore due to divorce rates. But we make it work a lot better than we've seen other people do it. And you know, we don't want to talk about the, the divorce aspect of it. We would just want to talk about the two people working together, whether you're in a marriage or you're in a co-parenting situation due to a divorce or due to never getting married. So you know, what has helped you in our relationship co-parenting for Christian? I think what you just said about even if you're married, I think it's hard either way. So I think that's one thing to set the level there is even if you're married in a happy marriage, parenting is not the same as being married. And parenting is a whole different, whole different drama, battle, struggle, different right. perspectives um, with a partner, with you know a divorce partner, whatever it is. So I think part of it is understanding going into it that you don't have the exact same perspective on anything. Like it's never going to be the same. But I think for you and I in particular – we put Christian first from the very beginning. Um, of course, there are rocky rocky days after divorce. Everyone knows that. But he has been the sort of the North Star for both of us of whatever you have to give up, whatever you have to do to make it work for him, you just have to do it. And there are days that it's sometimes not fun. And, and being a busy parent, obviously, a lot's taken, especially being professionals. But I think for us, it's just putting aside, in the beginning at least, our differences to come together for Christian. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. And it's, you know, how I have looked at it from my perspective, it's it's truly been a journey of that rocky road in the beginning to, you know, we use those those rocks in the road to kind of smooth it over into pavement. And and now it's a it's a lot smoother. Uh, and it's, you know, it's grown over time on understanding things and now doing doing more events together and and talking. And we mentioned like a, a weird little family, like, hey, we're, we're kind of like a weird little norm family now. We don't live together, but we parent together. And the I think the easy thing is we both have very similar values, which which makes parenting a heck of a lot easier. So I know the standard at, at my house for certain things is the standard, same standard at your house because our, our values are the same. And a, a lot of that we've both have had to develop due to our upbringing and our background and our you know relationship with our dads and our moms and just really learning more of how I don't want to raise a kid and what what I wanted to learn from that and in particular for me it's not you know my father not teaching me certain things that that he was an expert at so I've tried to teach Christian everything that that I know and I know he's not at an age for certain things that I know how to do so that's later on in life. And, you know, what are some things you learned from, from your parents that you thought, nah, maybe I don't want to do that with Christian? I, mean, I think there's, well, there's really two things to kind of take one quick step back. I think at some point when you go through a divorce, or, you, or even if you're not married and you're co-parenting, is deciding that you love your child more than you dislike the other person. Because there were days yes. that I disliked you very strongly. Not now. Update, <laughs> not now. But there were days I did not like you very much. But I always loved Christian enough that it wasn't worth it to jeopardize Christian's future or his right. relationship with me to hurt you. Like I just that's not my character anyway. I don't I don't operate that way. I think the second part of it too is also finding that that day, that moment in the sand where you decide to stop competing and start celebrating. So in the beginning of our divorce, for sure, you know, to your point, going back and forth from your house to my house, oh, dad can do this, oh mom can do this, and dad can do this. And so I think you and I were both we were trying to keep him happy and keep him, you know, copacetic and li- liking his, enjoying his life. And so you would do it and then I would have to do it or I would do it. You'd have to do it. And at some point I stopped doing that and said, let's celebrate the fact that dad can help you do that thing instead. And let's go in and do, do that with him instead. Or let's, you know, let me add on to that thing. 
um, versus me competing because a we we're going to go broke uh, and b it just <laughs> you know he enjoyed more of us coming together to celebrate something and so I think you have to make two decisions to forgive and to move on and also to partner and celebrate your your partner in this journey and not compete against them. So that being said, my family was not that way growing up at all. Um, one thing I learned from my dad that I think Christian is still trying to learn is just to work hard. Um, we, we weren't poor by any means growing up, but we didn't have a whole lot. But my parents just instilled with me from early on that if you don't work for it, it'll be taken away from you. And so whatever you have, you have to put your name on and own it forever. And so I'm very big about if you don't if you don't work for it and don't do your own hustle, you don't. It's not really yours, right? You, you, you're you're leasing it from someone else. Mm. So I think I want Christian to learn that lesson most of all with sports. We're obviously hockey right now. We're having a big struggle with him working hard <laughs> in hockey. Different issue entirely. But I, just, I always say you can't complain about the results you exactly. got with the work you didn't do. Hundred percent. That's that's the issue with him right yeah. now with hockey. Being upset with himself, but well, you didn't work on the ice and you didn't work off the ice at home. So. Why are you complaining? You got the results that you work for. I think it's a it's a weird thing of nurture versus nature because I think your your DNA and my DNA are both to win. We love to win. We love to work hard and get and see results, see improvement. And I think we're also very hard workers just as people. You know, I think we just work, even if it's not about winning, I just work hard. Christian didn't get any of that from us. Um, so it wasn't from nature. And I think nurture wise, can we, we get him tested for that? <laughs> we're Is both that way. Like, test for that? I'm pretty sure I had him. I know he's got mine, but I, there's days that we both say like, how is he our child? He doesn't have any of our, our nurture or our nature. Um, but he's also young and I think his life is very cush and he's not, you know, I had to be tested from early on to help my parents with the business. I was eight years old helping do payroll and, and work and he was eight years old playing on his iPhone and, you know, with his toys. So I think it's a different mentality, different era. But also, I don't want him to feel like I felt at that age, that I had to do all those things to survive sure. and resent it, you know, 39 years later. So I think there's a difference there, too. So let's talk about, I, I love what we do with Christian as far as fun goes. And, <laughs> and, but it also goes back to, to the discipline part, uh, why I think we're we're great co-parents together in that partnership is we understand that it's unique to Christian and I, I wouldn't recommend it to other kids. If I don't know their personality, I don't know their characteristics because that's it's a totally different experience. And it's one thing that I consistently hit on, especially during work is one thing that everyone should have learned from the pandemic is you can't have a one size fits all solution. So what I mean by that is what we're talking about here today, <laughs> like don't try, don't try to fit in with your kid. Our kid's very unique, but it's just ideas. And if something sparks a little light bulb in your head, like, hey, that maybe I should try that with my kid with their certain characteristics. But I know fun wise, he loves comic books. He loves reading, using his imagination. So that's what a lot of our fun in, entails. And the good thing is Christian doesn't listen to this. So, you know, uh, <laughs> besides his own episode, he, I think he told me he's watched it seven, eight times already. So uh, he'll never hear us talk about what we have planned for you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, you know, what goes through your head when you're planning something fun for Christian? You know, I think he needs experiences. He's a kid that has like tactile things everywhere. He's got toys in abundance, all that kind of stuff he has everywhere around him. And when I was a kid, I didn't go didn't get to go do a whole lot of things. Like we didn't go to Disneyland. You hear me say this all the time. I want to go to Disney for my own self at 39, but we didn't get to really go do anything. So I never got to travel much. I danced a little bit, but um, I don't I don't have the ability to look back on my childhood and say, we got to go to a great vacation at the Smoky Mountains or, you know, wherever else. I want him to have that. I want him to grow up and know that he got to go do all these fun things with his family and got to go see things and experience things and not just have toys out of a catalog. And so for me, I think about fun for him is just random experiences that we can't replicate, you know, at home, whether it's we went to the Clyde Warren birthday thing in the park. You know, that's something different and unique for him that he would have never gotten to do. Um, obviously, we're going to go to New York. We're going to do some things, you know, this summer. Hopefully, he and I on a cruise. And we're. I think we're going to go to Boston over uh, New Year's. But for me, I think he needs to go see the world and also to see how the other half lives. He's a very blessed child with lots of nice things because his parents work really hard. He needs to see how people around him live that aren't us and kind of get a, a perspective of the world that's different than his little curated, perfectly done sub suburban life um, that he lives right now. So, yeah, I think and for fun for him, too, is 
he's a bit of a wild child, as we all know. He's um, behaviorally a little bit um, ADD at times. So I think keeping him busy too and making sure that we're in a place where he is stimulated a lot and he's having a lot of fun doing things. Um, because if he has to go sit quietly somewhere and have his hands in his lap, as a nine-year-old little boy, that probably isn't going to be the right thing for him. So. And that, that's exactly what happens when I plan anything for him. And like you said before, it was more of a competition. And then, you know, slowly you start to think, I'm going to go broke. <laughs> and uh, why can't everyone enjoy this? Let's plan things together. Uh, but it, he's around that age where I started to think about, okay, let's do experiences mm-hmm. over things. And, you know, we can always buy a PlayStation 5. We can always buy a you know, new Nintendo Switch or whatever the new toy is that's out. But you can't always go to Disneyland. You can't always go on a cruise. And, you know, that was evident in, during the pandemic. Like, you couldn't do any of that stuff. It was shut down. And I still remember the trip that I took him on to Universal. I literally showed him my work phone and I threw it across the room. I was like, that's staying here. So let's just go have some fun. And he had fun all weekend. And it was just about us enjoying everything. And to your point, and we talked about this with New York, it's really for us. <laughs> We're just bringing him along <laughs> for the ride. And I think that makes us awesome parents for doing that. Like, hey, it's really us experience on this stuff that we didn't get the experience during our childhood. And now it's like, well, let's just drag the kiddo along and we'll call it a vacation. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think too, for you and I both, you didn't do a lot growing up either. So, you know, we're both kind of living, I hate to say vicariously through our child, but in some ways we are because we're trying to do the things for him we didn't get to do. But, you know, you mentioned universal. I think one of the problems, um, I look at other parents, you know, and try to compare myself, unfortunately, to other moms and how they live their life. And their kids are always so well rested and, you know, happy and not hyper. And Christian's always, you know, he's Christian. But when we go, we go hard. So when we go to Universal, we're, we're there from the time the park opens until the very last ride shuts down. I, I max out, you know me, I want to max out everything nonstop. And so, you know, he has learned, at least with me, to go hard. Like it's, you know, we, we go hard in the paint all the time. And so I do think part of it is learning as a child that you have to suck it up and that when duty calls, you got to show up, even if it's like fun things. You know, if I'm like, we're going to go an extra hour, go an extra hour. And I think he's learning even now that, when work is, is to be done or we have something planned, even his team with hockey, if you're tired, you got to go. So I think you can use the fun parts, too, to also teach other lessons and even thinking about, you know, do you want to get a toy or do you want to go on this other ride? Do you want to get this? Or do you want like learning how to negotiate and barter? And I do try, I try to make um, at least some constructive or instructive time when we're doing fun things, too. So it's not just a free for all, but th- th- that's sometimes harder than it looks, um, unfortunately. Oh, for sure. I still remember, you know, vividly in my mind when I took him to Disneyland in California three years ago. Gosh, it was three years ago. And it was raining. And we bought poncho, overpriced ponchos, by the way. Thanks, Disney. Uh, but he had a fantastic time. And we were standing in line in the rain. And I looked at him. I just said, I'm proud of you, buddy. He's like, what? I told him, I was like, you haven't complained one time. And we're here having fun, riding as many rides that are open, and you haven't complained once. He's like, well, I'm still having fun, Dad. And I'm like, okay, okay, so you're getting the point. <laughs> like, other kids don't even get to come to Disney. And yet, you know, it rained when we did, and we didn't let it get in the way. And we, we bought overpriced ponchos because we, you know, we could. I could afford them. Other people were walking around wet or went home. So we were still in, enjoying the experience and having a good time. But like you said, it was that teaching moment of, hey, we can either go home and say, oh, shucks, we have bad luck. Or we can suck it up and go enjoy some rides and enjoy that the, the lines are shorter because <laughs> everyone went home. Yeah, I think that part of it, too, though, even with the fun, is, and we discussed this the other night, I think you and I, you know, if we're driving home somewhere and there's a homeless person on the side of the road that needs grocery money. And Christian's like, mom, do you have any cash in your purse? He understands money because you mentioned the the ponchos being overpriced. He understands money in that way, but also that you have to have it to survive. His little classmate at school, you and I both know that he was really worried about her having her water bottle and having enough money to eat and have food. I think he's very tender hearted. I think we've done a good job of explaining to him that he does live a very posh life. And he'll say to me, oh, I know I have a really good mom. Um, Because I want him to know that there are kids all around him, you know, adults all around him that don't have the things that he has and that to have, you know, it's a great power, great responsibility di- dynamic of if you have, mm. if you can afford to do things for yourself and for your family, you should also afford for your community. 
And so I want him to, to think about that too. And as we're going and doing these really fun, amazing things to also give back and to think about being a charitable little kid and, you know, having a, a giving heart. So, and that's a very delicate balance at nine years old because they're, they want to go on Amazon and buy toys. It's like that 10 bucks could have gone to a toy. Why are you giving it to a homeless person? But he knows now, and that's thanks to you. Cause you, since he was a little bitty, have always done that. He knows that he has to give to the less fortunate. So I think that we've, we keep trying to instill that in him and he'll be old enough soon to like go work in soup kitchens and to go, you know, go do things and actually contribute Habitat for Humanity, help build houses and things. We're almost there, but I think at least now he knows he should be doing it. No, and, and it's good. And I remember the story you told me about his classmate and you know, he, he seemed so affected by the fact that mm-hmm. you know, she was so distraught that her water bottle was thrown away because it was leaking and she got it out of the trash and like tried to tape it up. And you know, you know, me, that just tugged at my heartstrings. I was like, I'm going to Target right now and buying that little girl water bottle. (laughs) That should not happen. And, you know, let Christian give it to her. And I love the story that he was like, oh, yeah, all the other classmates helped her decorate it and made her feel great about it. And to know that we we both instill that in him, you know, really warms my heart because he he will understand that when, when you have an abundance, you should give. And you should give over and above to, to help your local community out. And I think we both know I love helping local. I don't want to, you know, not that they don't need my help, but I don't want to go down to Africa and South America and all those places. I want to take care of where I live at. And I, I want him to understand that as well. Like, hey, we want to help locally because we live here. And it's part of the reasons I'm involved in St. Jude and, and MVP and show him that. And we've talked about just with his school. And the fall festival, there was a price for it. We're like, well, what about all the kids that can't afford this? Like, let's talk about how to raise more money. Let's do it. Let's throw a gala. Let's do this. And other parents overheard us talking, and they want to get involved and do that. So we, we're we fortunate to live in a great community to where we can do that, and our, our son can see that happen as, as well. Yeah, what, what I think is remarkable about the water bottle story is to catch everybody up because you, you haven't heard the beginning of it is – his classmate's friend, or his classmate, I guess their parents are going through some hard times with their mortgage and some bills and really couldn't afford to make ends meet. And Christian comes home and tells me like a little adult, mom, the bills are really expensive this month. They can't afford to get the water bottle. So his little classmate's water bottle is leaking um, and really went into like how bills work and they didn't have enough money in their paycheck and it wasn't payroll day yet. And in his little nine-year-old mind, he very much understood the um, reality of the fact that they didn't have money yet and they were trying to make ends meet. And so it reminded me that he's much more mature and much more aware and understanding of things that I protect him from, but that he probably should know because he's hearing about it at school. I think that's one thing that all of us as parents, kids today are so much more mature and they're so much more exposed than we were. Like I didn't know at nine years old. Well, I did because my parents were different. We had businesses. but Well, you ran payroll. Yeah. So. <laughs> none, none, of, none of my friends knew the fact that taxes were due and that we had you know mortgage payments were due. And he knew all of that. And his little friend was explaining to her classmates, you know, without embarrassment, because she probably doesn't even understand it either, what was happening in her household because she's hearing it at home. And so I think to prepare him, to prepare all of our kids to be able to take that situation and be empathetic and not make fun and, and help out is a lesson for all of us because it could have very easily turned into a different conversation where, you know, she's getting her water bottle out of the trash and it's dirty and gross and leaking and, you know, a bullying situation, but they turn it into something much better at his school. So I was proud of him for that. No, and that that's a great segue into a, a good question I always ask about finance and what you want to teach your kids about finance. And I've told Christian, I've said it on this podcast before, you're the smartest business person I know and I've ever known. Um, sorry to all my other <laughs> business guests, financial guests, all that good stuff. Uh, love you guys too, but so I've known her longer and I, and I know how her brain works. So what what do you want Christian to, to understand? Like he already understands some of the basics and then how much he has and what others don't, but you know, really almost detailed version of, Hey, here's a budget. Here's a finance. Here how here's how I have survived and become successful. Well, I was taught nothing um, at all from my parents. I was taught that credit cards are the Lord's work, and you should have lots of them. So um, <laughs> I didn't have a good understanding of financial planning as a child, and I went and got a degree in finance, which is actually shocking um, with that in mind. But one thing I want Christian to know, and any kid to know, is all about having enough for a rainy day. I think that's 
part of our culture today is that everyone lives on credit all the time. You're a great saver. I know that about you is making sure that no matter what happens, you have everything taken care of, that you can get your bills paid, you can have food on the table. And then once you've got that done and you know you can survive, then start thinking about saving, you know, whether that's crypto, which right now is not a good choice. <laughs> Disclaimer, don't, don't do that. Whether it's crypto, whether it's, you know, you're going to buy real estate, Airbnb properties, you know, the market, stock market, which is not a great return on investment easily, but whatever it is you want to invest in, but make sure that that becomes like an addition to just the basic survival money because COVID taught us, if nothing else, that liquidity comes and goes and you have to have something there in nest egg. I run our business the same way. The business that I run is I want to make sure that no matter what happens, I have payroll set aside for X amount of months. I can cover all of our bills that we can remain a going concern despite economic hardships before I start thinking about new investments and new ways to save or put our money to work. And so I think I didn't get that lesson at all. I got the lesson of, oh, there'll be a credit card around somewhere to put it on. You don't need to save any money. That's that's ludicrous. And I'm still digging out of, of that mindset, even as an adult now, knowing better because it was so ingrained in me as a child. So I think for a Christian, living inside your means um, and waiting until you're successful to do things that people who are successful do. You know, don't buy up. I think, I, you know, I have lots of friends who early on had really nice cars, really nice houses, and really nice clothes. And I'm like, I know what they make. How can they afford that? Again, credit card debt. Um, having a Gucci bag doesn't make you successful. And I think for Christian, he sees a lot of name brands. Unfortunately, I have a lot of my industry dictates I have a lot of nice name brand things. But realizing that having the best shoes and the best clothes and the best car doesn't make you any better at business, doesn't make you any better at being the smartest person in the room, being great at anything else. It's just a name brand. And so those are the kind of things for him to learn. And as he goes to run a business one day, he can instill that with his, you know, his payroll, with his people who work for him that we have to make the business work first and then we can make the business work for us. So that's kind of my overarching mindset. Good. Now, I mean, it couples nicely with what I try to teach him on living within your means. And I, I think he understands what I told him before. I'm like, look, I'm a builder. I, I can't build if I'm traveling all over the world on the days <laughs> that I don't have you. Like that's, that's excessive. And I think the same thing. I'm like, how, how do all these people, mainly IG women, travel all the time? Like, how are you in Croatia one weekend and in Costa Rica the next week? Even if people are paying for that, uh, because there's still an opportunity cost, you don't get to work. So I know if I don't get to work, I don't make any money. Mm-hmm. So there's an added cost for vacation for me. And it's, it's, how, it's how I bought my home. I didn't spend any money. I didn't get, I mean, it was the pandemic. So where the heck am I going to go? So I saved everything that, that I made and we took little trips here and there and had fun. But for the most part, I saved it because I, I'm a builder and I want something to, I want something for Christian to have once I'm gone. And I even view that for, for his education. And, and it's funny, people hear me say it all the time because we, we both have our doctorates, I don't really value higher education. I finished it because I started it. And you know, it, do I win more business because there's three letters behind my name or two letters in front of my name, depending on what I feel like doing? No, it, it's just people like you, they like your product and they view, they view your value proposition will benefit their company. It doesn't matter how much education you have. And for Christian, I don't have a college fund for him. I have just the fund. And when he turns 18, he can do whatever he wants with it. And I've already told him, if you want to start a business, you can start a business. Your mom can help you. I can help you. We'll help you figure it out. And if you decide you want to go to school after that, fantastic. But let's not pick you know, an art history degree, because you're not going to get a return on your investment on that. Uh, So being smart about even selecting going to college and where you go to college at, and that doesn't even matter anymore, where you go to college Mm -hmm. at. Everyone wants to tout, well, I went to Harvard, I went to Yale, I went to Princeton. Well, you all think alike, and you all paid the same amount of money. So are you really that different? You're you're not. So I, I don't really value higher education. I value more informal education, because that's what's made me successful. That's what's made you successful, is the informal education that we've received. I think it's high learning agility. I think it's 
uh, adapting to your surroundings, being chameleon. But, you know, for me, the interesting thing about you said Harvard, I have lots of friends. I work in the medical industry. Um, I run an EMR company who are Harvard trained physicians. They've spent many, many years at Harvard, whether it was residency, fellowship, and they come to me for their business advice. I'm like, you're one of the greatest business schools in the in the world, world renowned. And they learn nothing about that. You know, they learned they went to medical school. In my little Mississippi State, you know, state education, they're coming to me saying, How do I grow a business? How do I run a practice? How do I hire and fire and onboard? So I think it's it's a learned concept. Whatever you spend your time learning and and, and doing, you become good at it, right? You become a master of that trade. And so if he wants to go to trade school, he wants to do, you know, HVAC or whatever it is he decides to do. I mean, I, I employ 40 developers who none of them have a college degree and they write software all day long and they are badass at it. And they'll tell you, you just start learning how to code in your mom's basement and you figure it out. There is no college degree to tell you how to be a great, you know, a great developer. And Christian loves things like that. He loves coding and games and comic books and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I think the other part of that, too, for Christian is that he has a female in his life who is very dominant um, and, you know, in some ways I would say powerful, you know, he, he understands that women can be also awesome at things. And, um, although when he comes home and says, we Googled you at school, that's a little bit scary. <laughs> Thank God I'm not Kim Kardashian out there. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think he has a different perspective of if you work hard, it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, any of that stuff. It's like, you just have to go to work. And I think he can, he can certainly attest the fact that you and I work a lot more than I'd like too many days, but it's just a different world for these kids. Like when they go to college now, you have to start in like fifth grade deciding what you want your major to be and take the right classes, right? AP classes. I mean, what what fifth grader knows what they're going to be when they're 25 or 35 or 45? They don't. But if you don't start early, you have to go to rowing club and fencing club and hockey club. And you got to have extracurriculars that are a mile long. And they're doing all that stuff in high school. How can they also take all these AP classes and get ready for college and learn about the world and be culturally, you know, culturally relevant it's just not possible. So at some point, these kids are overloaded to the point that their little brains are going to explode. To me, it's just not worth it. Like, I didn't do all that stuff, and I turned out okay. You turned out okay. So there has to be another way, a better way in higher education than what we're doing right now. I just don't think it's long-term, it's not plausible. That's why China's kicking our butt in education, because they focus on what they do well, and that's all they do. They don't have to go to rowing club and fencing club. They go learn their skill, and they learn it for 15 years, and they become great at it. So I think we're just overarching theme. We're doing it wrong when it comes to higher education. And I would agree with you on that because we have turned it into a business and an industry when it never needed to be. Right. And there's, gosh, I believe A&M's endowment is 40 billion now. So it's, I mean, the endowments are ridiculous and all that is is your, your nest egg. If you're a business on, hey, can I still run this company? And they just, they continue to invest, but they don't invest in the students. They don't invest in the educational piece. It's how can we get them to take more hours, pay us more money, and they'll continue to take out loans because they're federally backed. And we'll get more students. We'll build more buildings. We'll put stuff here. And they don't concentrate on the education piece in, anymore. It's how do we get more people in here? How do we get more bucks? And we're good. And it's it's very interesting now to be on the opposite side looking in because I had aspirations to you know be an administrator in higher education. And now looking at it from the outside in the private sector, I'm like, you guys are doing it all wrong. <laughs> like you're yeah. like at the end of the day, your product sucks. Because you have all these students that have debt from purchasing your product, and they don't have a job to pay off that debt. Therefore, you have a sh shitty product. So how do we fix that? And I want to fix it. But with it, with it being so large and having such large endowments to you know, go and lobby uh, in Congress and say, hey, let's continue doing it the way we're doing it. Uh, I don't know if we can fix that. That's why Christian doesn't have a college fund and he has a regular fund. Like you said, he, if he wants to go to an HVAC school, if he wants to be a plumber, we'll help him figure out how to own 10 plumbing companies, exactly. 10 HVAC yeah. companies and, you know, live, live a nice life and enjoy it. And, you know, pardon the pun, but, you know, owning a plumbing company may be a little shitty to start <laughs> off with. But then you grow it, and it's, it's fantastic, and you don't have to deal with the day-to-day -day crap. And you can, you can continue to run your business, and I, I will say you will never have to be 
embarrassed by it either. Like there's, that's one common thing people have. They have waste. Mm -hmm. We're humans. We have human waste. You're always going to need plumbing. You're always going to have to clean it up. You're going to have to figure out sewage and pipelines. It's simple. It's why one of my good friends, Alan, started a trash company during the pandemic. It's like it's a common denominator, dude. Everyone has trash. So I started picking it up for people commercially, and I made a good, good amount of money at it. And it's just, you know, thinking that route. And it's one, one of the things I did like about living in Arkansas is, is meeting folks that were running, you know, that part of, of the, the state of education on, hey, let's push more people to trade school. We have manufacturing plants in, in Fort, 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 Fort Smith, not Fort Worth, Fort Smith, and we have them in north, northeast Arkansas, and in the south there's a lot of paper mills down there. So let's get more people educated on how to do that and how to run it more efficiently with the resources we have within the state instead of trying to recruit Google and Apple there, knowing you don't have the education uh, for those tech people to come in and you don't have the infrastructure either. So it's, it's always interesting to see people's perspectives, especially on education. I now view informal education a lot better. It's why I try stuff all the time that I suck at, like learning hockey. And then now I'm on two hockey teams. It's just having that veracity for learning. And we we've talked about it before. Um, you know, one of one of my biggest fears in, in life physically is coming down with dementia or Alzheimer's, losing the capacity to use my brain, what's gotten me to where I'm at. So it's why I constantly learn new things. It's not that I'm trying to be a renaissance man. I'm trying to look cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create neuroplasticity, new neuro pathways to help me continue learning and keep my brain working. It's what I hope. Christian picks up on, like, oh, hey, dad's learning how to play the guitar. Uh, is that to pick up chicks? Like, no, <laughs> it's, it's to build my brain, man. It's to get it, get it stimulated and keep working. Um, what, what new things do you teach him about that? Because we talk about neuro stuff all the time. We're just two nerds. And when we get together, we talk about, hey, yo, are you thinking about this? What about that? I talk about sleep all the time. I, I know you don't get a lot of it. Mm -mm. Uh, thankfully, I do, and I tried. I keep track of it. Like last night, I didn't get any REM sleep, according to my whoop, and that concerned me. I was like, "Did I? I thought I dreamt last night. Like, what? What? What did I? What did I do differently where I didn't get any REM sleep?" Yeah, I wear an aura ring. You have a whoop, and I have an aura ring, so I check my sleep a lot. But I did want to say one quick thing about the informal education part before we go on. Is sure. You went to A&M, so obviously a very connected school in Texas. You know, it's one of the, if not the premier organization, forget UT. I went to a state school, and people always say you go for your network. And I don't know that it's ever helped me out at all. I went to Mississippi State. It didn't help me out one bit. I learned to network on my own because I didn't have a choice. Finding rooms to be in, finding people to meet. And I do a lot of the wacky things that I do because of networking because I've met someone who's done it, or I find interest in the hobby, and then I meet people because of that hobby. And so I think – you know, even with neural plasticity, thinking about that aspect, but also because these hobbies that you find yourself doing allows you to meet someone else and then somebody else and on and on and on. I think networking sure. is the number one skill in business, period. Um, there's a great book called The Personal MBA. Josh Kaufman wrote it. I have an MBA and it's better than my MBA. I uh, read that book over and over again if you're wanting to learn you know, more about business. But I think that networking, we pay for education because we think it's going to get us into the right room. No, it's not. And even if it does, what are you going to do when you get there? <laughs> what are you going to talk about? You have no, you have nothing to talk about yet. And if you wait to go to trade school until you're 50 and you're paying off debt still from your 25, it's too late. Like it's, you, we've got an opposite. So I do think that there's a part of it where this idea that I have to go to Yale because I want all the Yale people to help me get a job later on. No, just be awesome. Just be the best person for the job. Just learn more, do more, be better. Yeah, and, and those Yale people that are connected to other Yale people, it's because their parents grew up together exactly. with money and they live in, they go to the same country club. It's not that they went to Yale. Precisely. But no, as far as what I'm learning right now, I'm always learning something. Um, I'm doing a lot of digital marketing. I'm launching a new marketing company, which is a whole new realm for me, SEO, Google Analytics, learning a lot about the back-end algorithms of that. I spent a lot of time on software development and learning how to do basic coding, Um but I think running a big organization, I've, I've hired rapidly. In the past two weeks, I've hired six people. Uh, our organization's tripled since COVID. So learning to be a, a, a boss, an employer, but also in the middle of scale, like giant rapid scale, 
Um, and I'm in a very heavy PE industry where the dry powder is like overwhelming here and everyone wants to buy everything that we do in, in aesthetics. So it's learning how to manage all of that at once um, and still be a mom. So I think my my challenge in learning is running a great business, keeping my employees happy and engaged and satisfied, making money, keeping the customers happy, but also going home at night and turning that off and like being a mom and understanding that, you know, I, Christian's only going to be nine years old for so long and then he's going to be, you know, 19 years old and not letting it pass me by. So that's a skill set, a truly a skill set that I work on developing every single day of how to do all of it and do it well. And obviously we can't do everything, right? But they say lean in. No, lean out. It's BS. You have to lean out. You have to lean out and think about your family, about your kids, about, you know, church, whatever it is that makes you happy, lean out and go do that thing or else you can't lean in the right way. It's just not possible. Yeah, and and you've done a you've done a great job balancing that, especially <laughs> especially lately. Uh, <laughs> and I say that because you know during the pandemic, I I read a, a book about raising boys and how we were failing doing that. And one of the the key components they mentioned was the relationship between a mother and their child, especially a boy. And you only have to about the age of four to really bond with him from birth to four, because those are the time bonding years where traditionally women stay at home and they take care of the kid and they're always around the kid. And unfortunately, due to your career, you didn't get the opportunity to do that. And I was always uh, afraid that Christian wouldn't bond with you that much. And like, okay, well, I had to take care of him during that time and you were gone, but it's been great to see him bond with you and, and really be an outlier to that statistic on, Hey, now he's bonding with mom and he enjoys spending time with her. And it's great to see him appreciate how hard you work, even though sometimes he gets a little mouthy and, and says, well, mom doesn't work that hard. Uh, I don't know about that. I call BS on that kid. Uh, so it's it, it's great to see to see that, to see the bonding happening between you and Christian and, and making that statistic for our situation void. And it's one thing that I, I always try to, to tell my guests and even my friends that aren't on the show, like, hey, really make an effort to bond with your kid. And I mean, Jordan Peterson stated it like your, your kids are only little for so long, four years. And then after that, they're grown and they start to resent you or they don't want to talk to you or you've raised a smart enough kid to where they start to question you. So then it's having that battle instead of just enjoying them being little and making mistakes and teaching them. And, you know, it's, it's great that we get to enjoy time with Christian and, and keep doing that. And I've, I've told a few people this. I think this is our last year for Santa, for him to believe in Santa. Oh, I don't know. We're still doing it up on the shelf this year. I don't know. I think he's going to believe yeah, in Yeah, but I, I, I don't think we're not going to tell him. I think it's going to be another kid at school. I think that's going to be the issue is him figuring it out. Because I, I don't write in my handwriting anymore any oh, yeah. letters from Santa. I type all that out. Uh, I know that's how I figured out Santa wasn't real <laughs> was I saw my dad's handwriting. It's like, that's dad's handwriting, letter from Santa, whatever. Uh, so it's just I want to continue those traditions as long as we can to keep him little as long as we can because things like this, the iPad and the mm-hmm. Internet – don't allow us to keep our kids little anymore. And there's there's conversations I've had to have with him already that because he saw something on TV or YouTube, like, okay, now we have to have this conversation. Great. Uh, oh, yeah. But let's talk about one of my favorite topics, food. Mm. We, uh, we unfortunately have expensive tastes, and now our son likes sushi, oysters, uh, things Wagyu. like that, Wagyu beef. Um, what are some of the, why would you spend the extra money on, on good food and experience? I view it as an experience. So the experience of that. I think that's why it's the experience. Um, prior to the last few years, I would never eat at home. Like I wouldn't have, I shouldn't say that. I wouldn't think about having a nice dinner at home. It would have never mm-hmm. crossed my mind, which I've learned how to do steak and things at home, which is, you know, made it easier. But to me, it's like the dining experience. It's going out, it's having conversations, it's having a glass of wine, it's eating great food, it's the ambiance of the restaurant. I think that that part of it to me makes eating worthwhile. I don't eat a whole lot as a person. I mean, just one thing my child thinks I'm fat, <laughs> chubby, <laughs> reminds me every day, which by the way, I'm not. But um, to me, like the going out and, and doing that part. But what I hate to do is pay a lot and get bad food. 
So I do kind of get into a groove where I know where I like to go and I keep going there. Um, and unfortunately in Dallas, there's a million places to eat and I don't have the time to go explore all of them. You are a big foodie, so you always know where to go. But I think that going to a place where you can enjoy the people that you're with um, and also for Christian when he's coming along that he can like be rambunctious and it not be um, a, a spectacle because he can sure. be a little bit wild. And I think when the wait staff, I mean, obviously some places that you go, the wait staff all knows him and they're excited to see him. And, you know, he feels like he belongs there. They're not ostracizing kids and making making them feel awkward. So that's important for me. But nothing beats a good glass of Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Nothing. If they have that, I'm probably going to be okay. <laughs> if they have that and some bread, I'll survive. <laughs> I, I'll tell him when he's older, but I would say one of my favorite, no, not one of my, the favorite meal I've ever had actually was in Oklahoma City, a place called Gray Sweater. Chef Andrew Black, if you're listening to this, still to this day, best (laughs) meal I've ever had. He doesn't have a menu. He cooks for you. And you just choose how many courses beforehand. And I still remember I chose, I think, the seven course meal. Knowing that it's a nice restaurant, portions are smaller. And I think we were three courses in. I was like, hey, could I upgrade to the 11 course? <laughs> they're like, well, let me ask the chef. So they come back and they're like, the chef said no. I was like, why? Does he not like money? Like, I'll pay him more money. That's what it is. It, no, he said it's a different culinary journey that he would take you down. And it, he can't alter it. So you'll have to come back if you want the 11. 11 course meal. I was like, okay, whatever. Just bring out course number four then. And he came by and spoke with me. He goes, I'm so glad you're enjoying your food and you want to go more, but I just, I can't do it. I don't cook that way. And I was like, soul, I'm (laughs) always going to come back here. (laughs) You don't want more money. And you made me the best grilled cheese sandwich I've ever had in my life. (laughs) He just started laughing. He's like, you like that, huh? I was like, out of all the other fancy stuff you cooked me, I was just like, the grilled cheese was the best. And, you know, it was it was infused with, like, tomato soup, but he also added a little caviar on there. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think it was going to match up. And I told him, I was like, it was like heaven, chef. And he's like, yeah, it was a play with the saltiness and this and the certain cheese I had in there. And it, it was, you know, he made an extra dessert for me because I liked his food so much. And then he spent 30 minutes talking to me just about what goes through his head, how creative he is, where he sources the ingredients from. And I looked at him. I'm like, you're a businessman. You're not a chef. And he goes, I'm a chef at my root, but I know how to run a business. And the great thing is you, that's why he has you pay for the courses. So you can sit at your table as long as you want and enjoy it. He's like, yeah, I'm not trying to churn tables here. He goes, all of the restaurants are trying to get you to the bill to get you out of there. I don't care how long you stay. He goes, I know how much it costs to run this place. I'll say two things to that. One is my death, um, like prison mill is Dickie's Barbecue. (laughs) <laughs> half brisket, half full pork. But I you haven't been to Terry Black's yet, then. It's hard to beat brisket from Dickie's. But I think the one meal I think about, I think about a nice restaurant, and this is going to be the most random thing you've ever heard in your life, is we didn't have a whole lot when we first got married. We were like, we were not living like we are now by any Correct. means. We went to New York to, I think like Gotham, what's it called? Gotham, Gotham City Grill. Grill, Gotham yeah. Grill. And it was like the first, I had been to China. I had done a lot of fancy things, but not on my own dime. I hadn't paid for it. We went there and had... Like a really expensive at the time, it was like three hundred fifty dollars. Like it, yeah, it was for our anniversary. Yeah, it's not expensive oh. now in context, but then it was like crazy expensive. And I remember if I think about New York and eating in New York, I will not ever go to New York and not think about going to that place. And I've tried to find it since then, like three or four times. Did it shut down? I couldn't recreate the magic anyway of it, but I've, I don't know. I don't know if I have the right name. If I'm like remembering it wrong, but that was like my most um, experiential or. I don't know, existential, whatever you want to call it, dining experience I've ever had probably. And I've been to places since then that were like, I mean, I've been all over the world. And I don't know why, but that particular restaurant, it was like our coming of age of like, we can afford to go do a nice yeah. thing. Like we could afford something that was like the other half, how they lived. I don't know. It was just, it was a special dinner. We went to the, the uh, Gabriel, what was his name um, in New York? 
not Kufner, something like that. It was also very, very good. That was five years ago, I think. Yeah, there's New York has the best food scene ever. Well, and on top of that, I think the pandemic, we put so much into it, it kind of aged us about 10 years, and we don't remember exactly what (laughs) happened. That's probably true. What day was this? What was this? Uh, All that good stuff. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I remember going to those restaurants, Mm -hmm. and still, I mean, we went to one in Vegas that was... um, Michelin star or mm-hmm. James Beard Award winner. I still remember the little amouge bouge that he gave us that had like watermelon. And I was like, how do you get watermelon that tastes this good? It's just watermelon. <laughs> so I I think that really bleeds into how I look at, at business, especially in healthcare. I want to see who's innovating. I don't want to see who's throwing together something in a microwave and then calling it, you know, worthy of 300 bucks. I, I want to see what goes on in your mind and how you're creating this or how you see a solution to a problem. And I think if, if I could teach Christian anything, that's just to look at what the issue is and help provide a solution because that's all I do for my job. And I've become very good at it. And I've been told no several times by leadership on things thinking outside the box. Like, no, we can't do that. I'm like, well, why can't we? It'll solve this. Uh, so it's just that I want him to be a critical thinker. And I think that's one of my main issues with higher education or education in general is we don't teach that anymore. And, you know, we, we really need to push that. And that's why, that's why I am a foodie is not only do I enjoy the taste, I'm a fat kid at heart, <laughs> but it's seeing how someone thinks. And let's add these two things together Maybe they mix, maybe they don't. That's why I'm addicted to the cooking shows. I think I told you several times I watch Bobby Flay's, you know, Titan, triple threat Titan, whatever it's called. And it's because it has Michael Vitaggio on it. And he throws out nitrous in the stuff and he's making new things. Like, well, the chemistry of this and the chemistry of that mixed together. I'm like, you're not a chef. You're a chemist. You're, well, you're creating all this stuff. Here's our life. I'm going to get Thanksgiving dinner catered, and Jonathan <laughs> wants to cook it. I'm like, I'll just cater it all in. Why don't you just show up? Um, because I, I don't love to cook nearly as much as you do. Like, I, I cooked as a kid because we had to eat, but I don't enjoy cooking. I'm not very good at it. I can attest to that. Christian would definitely tell everyone that if you asked him. Um, it's not my gig, but I can create a great experience. I'm a, an amazing party planner. I'm a great event host. I'll make sure everyone there is having a blast that they're, you know, being indulged in by everyone around them. I am great at creating an environment. So I'll do that. You bring the food. It'll be great. But if I have to do the food, you're all going to starve to death. All of you. (laughs) (laughs) It's not going to work. Well, and that's, I tell people all the time, I learned how to cook because I love how to eat. I, I love to eat. So I had to learn how to cook. And fortunately I had a mom that cooked at home, but along the way I had a chef that I became really good friends with during college. We just worked out at the same gym at the same time and talked about food. And he invited me over to the country club quite often. And, hey, try this, try that. And, by the way, having a chef friend is the best friend to get drunk with because they will cook you food (laughs) at the end of the night at their house. It was awesome. Uh, But but I think to that, I will say this, when you, for those of you who are in a divorced relationship or, you know, even, even when you're married, one thing that you have for Christian is you are great at like keeping things together. Like I say, even now I say all the time, gosh, if you were here, you would have just handled this, like making sure all the bills get paid on time, making sure the food's all done, that the groceries are bought. Like you're a Mr. Mom, because I, to your point, I was working every day all the time for like the first four years of Christian's life. I was never home. I was traveling like 250 days a year. You just handled everything, right? You just do that kind of thing. I don't like that stuff. I'm out like being a crazy person, working and being creative and ideating. You just have it all handled. So I want Christian to learn how to do his own laundry. Like all the things you know how to do, laundry, dishes, food. You have all that. I've never heard you say like men don't do that. You do all the things that women do better than most, better than me for sure. <laughs> so I think if he has to learn any skill is to be a great, to be a great husband, a great partner, a great dad, you have to be able to do all the things that your partner can do in some ways to help them out. Otherwise, it's never a give and take. You know, you're not going to be as good at me at some things or, or nor me as you at others, but to be able to jump in and help, I think is really important. Even now we do that for each other too. I think it's important even in this relationship that you have to be able to jump in and help because at the end of the day, you know, it, li- it lightens the load for everyone. Yeah. And 
I think you know this. I absolutely love comedy. Love it. Love especially stand-up comedy. Chris Rock put it the best, where he said, a marriage is not 50-50. He's like, damn it, it's usually 90-10. And it depends on the day. Some days you take the 90, some days you have the 10. And it's that trade-off. And I wouldn't necessarily say those things are things, uh, well, in traditional sense, women have have done. But for me, it was always just being self-sufficient and not having to have someone do my laundry or pay someone to do my laundry, to do my lawn, to cook for me, to clean the kitchen. It's actually stuff I hate. I hate doing all that stuff. I, I wish I paid someone to do all that so I didn't have to worry about it. But I don't. I, and, and to me, especially, I've said it on this podcast before, I actually enjoy doing the lawn. That's why I don't pay someone to do it. It's, it's not a high cost. I just enjoy it. It's mind numbing to me. So I get out there and I have 45 minutes to not think about anything. I put on some music. I jam out. Sorry to some of my neighbors if you see me dancing <laughs> to rock music. Uh, but I'm just jamming out. I'm having my me time and enjoying it. It's not thinking about anything other than cutting the grass. And I've gotten to the point where I get aggravated about it now. Where I'm like, there's a weed over there. Damn it. Why is that weed there? Did I not fertilize enough? Did I not put this down? And it's, you know, it's, it's a good thing. But I, like you said, it's teaching Christian to be self-sufficient. It's doing this. And it's, it's part of what we've taught him already to, to not view the world through a lens of black and white. It's not male, female. Women shouldn't be, you know, chief growth officers of tech companies and healthcare. No, they can't. Actually, your mom is one. So it's, hey, you can flex either way you want to and do it. So like you said, if you want to work in HVAC, work in HVAC, but be the best damn HVAC worker you can and have a couple companies for it. Or if you want to go the traditional educational route, do it, but be the best you can at it. And I think that's what we're both trying to teach him is whatever you want to do, just do it to the best of your ability and, and work your ass off at it. Yeah, just as long as it's not like being an actor or something. Although he is a really creative kid. But I would say on the, <laughs> on the paying people to do it, one business piece of advice is if it keeps you from doing things that you can bill for and that you can make money on, hire it out. I look at that all yeah, the time. Yeah, 100%. Like, like if, I can't, if I can go get groceries or I can do some consulting time, like what's a better choice of my time? So fund your own personal assistant if you don't have one at your company. So you'll have one at home and help, that can help you. Uh, but yeah, I, I love doing my lawn, but it just there's no time in the, day, in the day for that anymore. So I have a really great lawn guy, but... Um, groceries, all that, I just hate it so much. I hate going to Target because I'll spend $400 trying to go get a piece of bread. You know, I just, I can't be trusted in Target, so I can't go. It's not good for me. So you're like everybody else that goes yeah. to Target. You walk in for one item and you spend $200. Exactly. And my little boy wants to spend another 100 bucks on toys. So we, we just can't go in. It's just We have to do like Instacart <laughs> so we don't spend too much money. So we're coming up on time, and I always like to end with, if, if there's one thing you want Christian to know, what is it? I think you've said it throughout the podcast is just to work hard at everything in your life, not just at, at traditional work, but at being a great friend, a great partner, a great colleague um, in your community, in your church, wherever it is that you want to live your life. People can't take that from you. They can take away a lot of things, but they can't take away your work ethic and your stick to itiveness. And if you want it bad enough, then it will come through in your work and you'll fight for it and be hungry. And so this is his grades, it's going into college, it's getting into a technical school, whatever that may be for him. I want him to know the value and the intrinsic um, celebration of working hard for something and achieving it and how good it feels to believe in yourself and to know that you can do it and you can handle it. Um, I want him to feel that feeling. I don't believe in luck. I believe in hard work and sometimes coincidence. But if I can teach him anything, it's just to put your head down and go and go fast, move fast, break shit, fail, get back up and go again. Uh, and that's that's what life is. But you just got to keep plowing forward. Great. That's that's perfect. It's a great way to end it. And, you know, this will be the second episode that Christian will watch because I'll make him watch it. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, all that other good YouTube stuff that all the kiddos say. Uh, we will see you in two weeks. And Tiffany, thank you for coming on again. Thank you for having me.